So, first question, obvious question. The record, the album, Guy. Why Guy? Why you? Why now? Well, I had really good teachers are the reason I'm able to do this. I got really lucky and that well, I was in the right place at the right time and, and knew what the wrong place was. And, and as cool as Austin was at the, you know, when I sort of got out on my own, I just figured out that for me, the weather was too good and the girls were too pretty and the dope was too cheap and I wasn't going to get anything done. I already knew Towns and I knew everybody that a lot of people that knew Guy. So I headed for Nashville and, um, Richard Dobson, who I knew from here, was tending bar at a place called Bishop's Pub. And I, all I was there was just waiting to meet Guy, and uh, more than anybody else. And I'd never heard him sing. I'd never, I, I knew his songs because Jerry Jeff Walker had recorded them. But um, I just, uh, it was the last, the missing piece of the puzzle. And then I walked into Bishop's Pub one night, and, and Richard said, Guy's in the back. And I walked back, and I had this beat the hell cowboy hat that I nobody would have recognized me with that at the time. And I just slipped into a corner and watching him shoot pool. And he was lining up a shot and he saw me in the corner and he said, nice hat. And the conversation started there. And, and he just, for some reason, he, he found out I knew Towns and then he heard a couple of my songs and he, he, he got me my first publishing deal. I wouldn't be doing this without him. So um, I think teaching's important. You know, I teach myself. I had good teachers. I had a couple in school that were actually pretty good that pointed me in the right direction. And um, but then I met Towns, and then I met Guy, and I and there was this moment of this this salon really in Nashville at the time. This this group of songwriters that were, you know, and the the, the inmates were in charge of the asylum for about <laughs> thirty seconds when I got there, and then it ended. But but I oh, got there nice. in time to learn a lot, and and I just so I made the you know you know Towns died you know so he was only 51 you know and and he was gone and and so i made that record a few years later and um you know after having made that record i kind of had to make this one because i want to run into guy on the other side having made the town's record and not made his. No, that would be that would not be good. it would be severe and bad for me so what is it about those songs guy and town's very different of course but what are what is it about the guy songs the way he writes songs that just kind of grabs you and so many other people, obviously. They're, they're essentially incredibly well-constructed prose that happens to rhyme. I'm not saying they're not poetic, but at their heart, they're not poetry. They're, they're prose, whereas Townsend's stuff at its heart was poetry. Um, he, um, you know, my tendency was to want to write longer stuff. Guy and I were drunk for three days after the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald went to number one because we just had this tendency to write these historical pieces that were long and they were real stories that had a beginning and a middle and an end. And, you know, we, we set about trying to figure out uh, how to tell stories in less and less time. You know, Guy was a master at it. He could, you know, that guy, um, Jack Prigg, that Desperado's Waiting for a Train's about, that was his, it wasn't really his grandfather, it was his grandmother's boyfriend. And that's a relationship that begins when he's like about eight years old. And so all of that stuff when he's a little boy, that, that incredible, you know, memory of detail. Uh, you know, I know, and I guess because I was a Texan too, and I had an uncle who worked for the railroad, he used to come get me and tell my mom, hey, I'm going to take the boy and buy him a soda pop. And he said, son, where's the nearest beer joint? And... You know, I, I, I related to that song almost immediately because of that. And it's just that deal of, you know, the, the, the oral tradition in Texas <clears throat> is a big deal. And I thought there's a lot of reasons that I could go on and on and on about, about why I think that's true. But we're storytellers here. Texans speak in analogies. When you ask a Texan a question, you know, be prepared to be around for a while waiting <laughs> on the answer. And it, it's just he... he um, he refined that something that Texans do and something that he grew up with into art, into this thing that, that he worked at and worked at and honed until I think he was the greatest story songwriter that's ever lived. Well, there's the storytelling, there's the vivid imagery, and then, like you say, just putting it to rhyme and to the music, and you've got it made. Yeah. So how, in the name of God, do you decide which songs to cover of Guy Clark and a tribute record? Well, there was some surrender involved. I, I, you know, because the difference between Guy and Towns is like the difference between Kerouac and Ginsburg. 
you know, Kerouac and Towns were were not that disciplined and didn't live to be old and and didn't write much the last decade or two of their lives. Guy lived twenty years longer, just like Alan did, and and wrote till the very end. And he wrote pretty much every day, or at least tried to. And you know, I I tried to emulate that. Thank God. And and uh, it's. Uh, it's one of those deals that I just don't um, – uh, his stuff – God, it, the way he did everything. You know, he built guitars, and they're beautiful instruments, and they sound great. And it's something that he'd been doing all of his life. He built a boat. He, he grew up part of the time in West Texas, part of the time in Rockford. And when he was a teenager, he built a boat. And it's <laughs> just it's just the kind of guy that he was, and, and he just didn't have um, – it was pretty easy to believe that anything that you could do anything, you know. But just watching Guy Clark just just live his life the way that he did. So when you're doing a record that's a tribute to to such an iconic, iconic songwriter and somebody who you worship, how do you put yourself inside his songs? Well, I mean, the songs on this record, you know, are the ones that I was closely, most closely attached to myself. So. A lot of people are heartbroken because the cape's not there, and there's some other songs I could have had on it. But I went with the stuff that I was either there when it was written, or the stuff that I just related to myself as a listener. And that's, you know, I just finally decided it's my Guy Clark record. You know, so uh, I had to just let people want to be mad at me; they could be mad at me. But I just, you know, getting inside of them is like this pick right here. This is the only kind of pick I can use, and it took me years to come around to this. But as far as I know, Guy Clark invented it. This, these are made by a guy named Fred Kelly in, in Chicago. He manufactures them. But Guy Clark used to take flat picks because he couldn't hang on to a flat pick and he wanted that attack of a flat pick. <laughs> and he would he used finger picks and, and, and a thumb pick for years. And he started making his own combination flat picks. It's, if you look, look at it closely, it's a, it's a flat pick with the band from a thumb pick to hold it on your finger yeah. attached to it. Pretty and as far as I know, Guy Clark invented this. And it's the way I play guitar. I didn't, I, I guess I knew it was true, but I was sort of stunned when I started doing these songs about halfway through the process. It's like, I'm, I'm more Guy Clark than I thought I was. You know, who mm -hmm. I am as a performer and as a writer. I knew as a writer, but, but as a guitar player, um, it's, more of it comes from Guy than probably anybody else. You said in some interview, probably somewhere, that the job of a songwriter is empathy. Absolutely. What do you mean? I mean that people don't care what um, you know what your experiences are. They care about your experiences that they can relate to. Um, the the big lesson was, I was uh, doing a fundraiser in Nashville, and Johnny Cash was on it, and he came all the way across the room, and he said, "Man, I really like that song of yours, Little Rock and Roller." And at first, I was just trying to keep from, you know, like passing out because Johnny Cash said he liked one of my songs. And then, you know, I, I bragged, went on bragging about it. And then I was on touring about 10 days later someplace and ran, I was coming out of a truck stop headed for my bus. And a truck driver, you know, stopped me. He said, you're Steve Earle. And I said, yeah. And he goes, and that, that was probably the first time anybody really recognized me in public. He said, man, I love that little rock and roller song. And then it dawned on me that what did Johnny Cash and the truck driver have in common? That they both have kids and they traveled and they miss their kids when they're gone. So, you know, it's, 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 that's what it's about. It's what people, you got to be willing to put some of your stuff out there. You can only write about what you know, but it's also important to keep in mind that, that um, people don't want to hear you feeling sorry for yourself because you're riding around a bus that costs more than their house. That's, that's one <laughs> thing. And, they do think that I do have the best job in the world, and I've never tried to lose sight of that. I get to do something that I love doing and make, you know, an embarrassing amount of money for a borderline Marxist doing it. So, <laughs> you know, always, you know, respect for the audience, you know, will keep you in line of that as a writer, that, that idea of empathy, the idea that, that it's how you feel and it's important that it's how you feel. But looking for the things that you feel that you're pretty certain somebody else it, it has felt before. In other words, what this does, what songs do I think better than anything else is that it makes people know that they're not alone. You know, that's mm -hmm. 
That's the empathy. It is. And it, they connect with different people in different ways. Absolutely. Speaking absolutely. of borderline Marxists, so what's with the hammer and sickle and uh, skull and crossbones on the drum head? I'm, I'm a socialist. I don't think there's any secret about that at this point in my life. And it just started a long time ago. It was the idea of being, you know, uh, you know the, the, the association with skulls began with Copperhead Road. I wrote this song about a guy who's a Vietnam vet, and um, he's, uh, you know, growing marijuana up in some holler in Tennessee. And, that, and I designed that cover, and, and, and my concept was a patch. You know, there were some units, some military units that had skulls incorporated mm -hmm. in, in, into their logos. And I just made up this patch, the idea of, you know, th this was his military unit. And, and we just, so we actually had a, um, um, it was, uh, we had a seamstress in L.A. make the patch. You know, she did hand embroidery patches, made the patch, sewed it onto a piece of camouflage cloth and shot that as the cover. And it was all, you know, it was just all part of that story. It was like, because it's, it's, it's a concept album, at least side mm. one is. It's yeah. my post-Vietnam record. It's us reacting to, you know, the same period as when, when Platoon comes out and, and, and Bruce makes porn in the USA. We were all finally starting to talk about Vietnam. Mm. It just took 10 years before anybody was going to talk about it. in that context. Yeah. All right, so one of, when it comes back to Guy, one of your few regrets is that you never co-wrote a song with him, not for his lack of interest by any means. Right, and, and, and see, keep in mind that one of the things Guy taught me was not to co-write. He didn't co-write very much. I mean, Susanna did it. You know, he and Richard Dobson and Susanna wrote Old Friends, but that was years later, and, you know, after we were both touring, and I was sort of out of touch, so I don't know when he changed his mind. I do know that he kept himself writing towards the end when he didn't feel good. He had cancer for a long time, and he was really tough, and he really fought, but it was like, you know, he he just, um, he kept, he figured out that bringing these, these kids in and writing with them, you know, would keep him writing, and he'd write songs that he wouldn't have written otherwise. And he told me one time, you know, I was there visiting, and he was at home. He, was, he wasn't in the hospital. He was at home. And I was just at the house. And I was getting ready to leave. And he said, you know, we need to get together and write a song on one of these trips. And he said, not for us, for the grandkids, he said. Because by that time, we both had grandkids. And, and, and uh, I said, yeah. And, and I would do it. And I do co-write from time to time. But I don't do it that much. And, and I live in New York. And I got there when I got there. And, you know, a lot of the times the last couple of two years, he just – wasn't didn't happen to be feeling great when on the days when I got there it was just sort of a some days better than other situation and I don't have very many regrets you know that sounds odd coming from somebody that's that's uh, messed up as much as I have but the truth is my survival has has you know dictated that I come to terms with most of those regrets and that one's I'm not sure I ever will be able to you got a lot of guy in you though though even without <coughs> without having co-written with with him you know yeah, so I mean, it's plenty it's of funny channeling through you in one way or another. Well, I hope so because you know I don't, you know, when this record, the Towns record, by the time I made it, there was this sort of hipster faction that had discovered Towns Van Zant, and there was an audience that I already knew was there. Guys, probably, you know, these two guys are my teachers. My audience is not the biggest in the world, but it's actually larger than their audiences were for their own records, and mm -hmm. and I knew that. And part of the mission is for some people to hear these songs that they've never heard them before. But then after I made the record, I, it dawned on me, this record, the response to it's been incredible. And these songs are so much more accessible than Townsend's songs are. When people hear these songs, they get it almost immediately. It's like, you know, they don't know, they don't need to know who Guy Clark is or was. They need to, they just need to hear the story these stories tell themselves.